Good evening, everyone. Um, I know it's right now, right at 5.30. We are just gonna give it uh, kind of a two minute warning uh, and then we will begin uh, our official uh, session for this evening. Uh, welcome for all of you that are right on time and thank you very much. I appreciate you being here right at 5.30 to get us going and we'll begin in just a few minutes. Okay, it's, uh, we waited the, the two minute warning and, and I wanna uh, honor all of you that are on time and, and appreciate uh, you being with us this evening. Uh, just a couple things that I'll share as we begin uh, this, this evening. One is that uh, we have all of you uh, tied in obviously to a, a Zoom setting which allows you to interact uh, with us. We ask that you keep uh, yourself muted until you need to, to speak. Uh, you can either uh, speak by making a, a motion over your uh, cursor, which will identify that you're ready to talk or ask a question, or you can present the question in the chat and we will pay attention to that as well. Um, we have a variety of, of folks that are on tonight beyond you that are Little Rock School District staff to assist should you have any questions, in particular on the second part of the agenda of talking about students support that we uh, provide to exceptional children. Um, so. The, uh, this evening is really about trying to um, allow us to uh, continue to grow as uh, we move forward on this election. And I know for many of you, that's just right around the corner. I've really enjoyed the opportunity so far. I've got to meet with probably, uh, I think five or six of you. I've got another five meetings tomorrow uh, with individual uh, individuals who are running for uh, a board seat. And I, I very much appreciate that time to get to know each of you a little bit better. This is also a procuser for anybody that has this coming up tomorrow. Not to be nervous, it's, it's kind of an opportunity for um, me to get to know you a little better, me to share just a couple things that I'm looking at or as priorities that I, I hope uh, will be considered. And then having you be able to ask any questions that you might have about the district or about myself, about our leadership team, whatever it might be that, that, that you bring up. And uh, so it's kind of a, a good one-on-one -on -one time where you get to be, uh, it's your time. And um, I don't know, many of the candidates take right up to that hour um, and, and, and use it. Um, it ends up being a, a, a pretty fast paced hour. And I, I am looking forward to meeting the rest of you uh, virtually in a Zoom meeting. Uh, and many of you, are, that will be happening tomorrow. Um, I appreciate the efforts of uh, Dr. Owa to put this all together and his assistant, Mr. Hutchinson. I want to call both of them out for helping execute this. Also appreciate Ms. Smith, who is 
um, behind the scenes. And the reality is that the public can also watch this meeting if they so choose. And we did publicize it so that anybody can uh, look at what's going on with the background work uh, to prepare everybody for uh, running and being on a school board. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Oa, who will kind of uh, set the next phase uh, for our, our agenda. And uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Oa right now. Thank you, Superintendent Porter. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have some uh, guests with us, some sitting board members from around the state who will uh, participate in a panel this evening uh, to just provide their perspective uh, from sitting on a school board. And then we have our district leaders, uh, school leaders, uh, who will present a short uh, presentation on student support. Uh, systems and programs that we have throughout the district to uh, give you uh, a brief overview and an idea of the type of supports that we provide our young people. Um, because uh, our panelists are joining us um, uh, at this time, we're going to go ahead and, Mr. Poor, if you do not mind, we're going to go ahead and uh, jump to the presentation of the student supports and then come back with the panel. Uh, if that uh, is okay with you. Okay. That so, is fine, and, and I, I know the staff will appreciate the fact that they can move on with their evening, so that, that may be a thoughtful way to handle it. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, the Student Services Division is uh, headed by Dr. Uh, Freddie Fields. He's the Senior Director of the Division. Uh, the Division works collaboratively with students, families, uh, staff members in the community to reduce barriers with which prevents students from achieving success in schools. Uh, you'll see several of his directors present tonight on just briefly what their uh, departments and offices uh, support, how they support our young people and families. Uh, we provide supports that are responsive to the needs of our diverse student body while facilitating healthy, safe, and orderly schools. This is his uh, student services organization chart. As you can see, he oversees the student services, care, counseling, dropout prevention, Hamilton, uh, Learning Academy, uh, health services, mental health services, special programming, student hearings, and the juvenile detention services. Of course, uh, Student Registration Office, most of you are familiar with that. That oversees the student enrollment from kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, that office works with parents throughout the process of registration or school changing uh, during the school year by informing them of the available options of their attended zone schools, our magnet programs, the Public School Choice Act procedures, and other types of transfers. Uh, the school uh, resource, I mean, registration office manages student assignments to schools, facilitating the efficient use of district's resources. Can I jump in on that one just real quick? Um, yes, as, as school board members, uh, Little Rock is unique. Uh, if you go back up on the slide, uh, oh, thank you. And I know Dr. Fields does a great job of trying to manage this this office because we do have magnet programs throughout our district. And most of you are familiar with that because you're longtime residents, but that does make us unique. It also makes it very unique in terms of when parents have to apply for those positions and, and some of the, the structures behind it. There is policy that relates to this that helps govern how Dr. Fields uh, responds to parents that are seeking these options. But it is one that, that brings up a lot of it, a lot of questions um, to board members. And so I just kind of wanted to call this one specifically out um, that there's a lot more depth to this one. And, and what we want from board members as, as you run into questions or uh, whether it's during the campaign or once you're elected is to, to be able to reach out to us so that we can help educate you and help you be able to make good decisions as we move forward on our big priorities. The district also provides the CARE program, which is a nonprofit self-supporting program of affordable child care before school and after school. Uh, <laughs> You can see that we start uh, the before school care starts at seven o'clock a.m. until school begins, and then it starts after school at five thirty p.m. 
as, as well as doing during all nine school days that teachers are working. Uh, DHS license program offers creative and recreational activities for students who participate in the program. Mrs. Grayson, our director of counseling is on. She'll uh, present the counseling department. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Counseling is a professional school counselors participate as members of the educational team and use skills of leadership, advocacy, collaboration to promote systematic change in our schools. School counselors are certified by <laughs> with a minimum of a master's degree in school counseling. They are uniquely qualified uh, to address all students' academic, career, and social emotional development. Little Rock School District currently has 59 counselors and a coordinator of counseling. 26 of those counselors are elementary, 14 middle school, and 19 are high school. Currently, our counselors are helping uh, our students get reacclimated to school, uh, checking to see if students need additional support, whether that be in the classroom or outside the classroom, and then making those referrals where necessary, and working on the social and emotional learning of our students. We also provide support in our safe and drug free areas with dropout prevention and truancy compliance. This department encompasses several important areas of support for, for our students in providing prevention, reduction, and intervention initiatives to improve attendance uh, district wide. They oversee attendance, truancy, truancy, and comply with ADE regulations that, uh, regarding attendance and truancy court notifications. Uh, you will note that the department supervises 14 school-based dropout prevention coordinators, and they support school and maintaining safe, drug-free environments for all of our students. They also participate in adult education services, as well as uh, the general uh, the GED testing program. This district also provides an alternative learning environment. Uh, it encompasses the programs for secondary students in grades six through eight based at the Hamilton Learning Academy, and then grades nine through 12 at the high school ALE program Metro campus. The ALE alternative learning environment program for grades K-5 is at Washington Elementary School. The ALE setting provides an environment that eliminates barriers to learning for students whose academic and social emotional progress is negatively affected by a student's personal characteristics or situation. So the program is designed to support our students who may need a smaller setting, a different uh, setting, instructional setting, and definitely not to be punitive. In our health services department, of course, we have that department providing our support to students by providing education, as well as the health services that are necessary to promote our students' optimum level of wellness, school attendance, and academic success. Uh, the services consist of the health room assessments, interventions, where each nurse cares, cares for 20 to 60 students per day. And I'll pause and note that uh, we also have uh, health-based, school-based uh, clinics within our uh, school system, within our district as well. And so we'll uh, share information about those uh, health-based clinics uh, with you uh, in future uh, training opportunities. They manage chronic diseases such as asthma, diabetes, seizure disorders, and life-threatening allergies. They also oversee the required vision, hearing, height, and weight screenings and monitor the Arkansas Department of Health vaccine requirements. Our mental health, health services department, Ms. Grayson, are you taking that one? Or is Ms. Williams? I can take that one. Uh, the Mental Health Service Department provides an oversight for non-contracted mental, uh, mental and behavior your health agencies to ensure that the student and families in the district receive quality mental health services. The agencies provide individual group and family therapy, case management and medication management. These services also include home visits and resource packets for family. The department works with the truancy department and school counselors to support students who are struggling with attendance and other issues. Uh, mental health and social emotional learning is needed now more than ever due to the relentless presence of COVID-19 and some specific services have been provided by mental health and counseling. 
mental health services uh, virtually. There's telehealth and on-site for students and families by contracted agencies. SEL training and support for administrators, teachers, and school staff. We also provided some training for parents earlier before school started. Resources for parents and school staff on the district website involving social emotional learning, SEL course in Schoology for educators with focus on yoga, meditation, and self-care. Thank you, Ms. Gregson. And the special programs, uh, special, special programs department oversees the implementation of the Individuals with Disabilities Education, we call IDEA, for the district's 3,100 students with disabilities. Under IDEA, students with disabilities receive a free, appropriate public education designed to meet their unique needs and prepare them for further education uh, after their 12th grade year with us, employment and independent living. The department also supports compliance with Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act regarding protecting the rights of students with disabilities by providing appropriate accommodations. And then uh, the Student Services Division also houses the Juvenile Detention Program, uh, which the Educational Component and Services to Pulaski County Juvenile Detention Center in the Pulaski County Detention Center. Students uh, from ages 10 through 18 are provided a public education while in those facilities. And we oversee and support our students who participate or who are involved in, in that program. In addition to that, we provide academic uh, supports uh, as well. In our English for Speakers of Other Languages, ESOL department, we provide two instructional specialists as well as two instructional facilitators. That team provides site-based instructional support for all schools with English learners. Also provides support, uh, support to our educators through professional learning communities, modeling, small group intervention, and technical assistance. Uh, the department assists 10 schools with additional funding to cover the Lexia program that enhances the reading uh, skill set or capacity for our young people. In addition to that, uh, the ESOL department provides supplementary supports through instructional modifications and testing accommodations. So they partner with our assessment office to ensure that our English learners uh, students are provided the very best uh, assessment based on their current needs. They also participate in progress monitoring uh, through the site-based LPAC committees. They uh, assist with new student identification while uh, and even during these times during the virtual uh, learning option as well. And so they provide that to our virtual learners at a remote assessment location and others will be assessed in person at the respective campuses. We also provide our dyslexia uh, supports. Uh, we have two dyslexia specialists uh, in our district. Yes, sir. I'm going to interrupt you and just go back on the uh, ESOL slide. And I, I know I see Dr. Henry in there as well. Could one of you just provide the uh, incoming board members a kind of a percentage of uh, what type of population we're dealing with here, just so they have a rough idea of how many students are impacted in this area? And we probably should have done the same thing with SPED if you don't want to. Dr. Henry? Yes, I'm here. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. We presently have close to 3,000 English learners between kindergarten and 12th grade, and those students are distributed on every campus across the district. The majority, and that represents um, on average roughly 13% of the district's population. Um, and those students represent a diversity of languages. The majority of those students are from a Spanish speaking language background and the rest of them are made up of anywhere up to another 30 or 40 different languages. Thank you, Thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing that. And uh, one of the things about this, also the students with IEPs and then our students with uh, ESOL is that these all can be broke out by categories. So if you go back to the tool called My School, uh, you can actually disaggregate by individual schools to see how we're doing or by a district and you can do comparison data. 
So I just want to use that as kind of a plug that there is an accountability level. Um, and, and we're actually very proud of the accountability within this particular group because uh, we, our staff does a great job under Dr. Henry's leadership. Uh, and can we go back a little bit? And I don't know whether Dr. Fields or you, uh, Dr. Owa, would handle the uh, question on the percentages with uh, students that have IEPs. Dr. Fields. Yes, sir. Do, uh, do you have the percentages for uh, the number of students uh, who are serviced via IEPs? Little Rock School District uh, increased uh, to 3,100 students this year. We had roughly 2,000, probably 2,300, 400 last year, and we've increased to um, 3,100. In addition to uh, what I stated earlier about dyslexia, uh, our specialists uh, help oversee the screening, response to intervention, and then placement for our students who need support in the area of dyslexia. They provide instructional support uh, for our tier two reading intervention programs, Just Words, and our tier three dyslexia intervention program, Wilson Reading System. In addition to that, the additional support is provided through monthly support sessions, professional learning communities, modeling, school visits, team meetings, and ongoing professional development provided to our educators. Of course, we have a screening process. The initial screening process for all K-2 students uh, is provided there. And I'll note to all of you that this PowerPoint will be shared with all of you uh, first thing tomorrow morning. And so you'll receive that so you're able to receive the links as well. The level one and or level two screening for K-2 students who show need on the initial screener or grades three through 12th grade students experiencing difficulty in word, word level reading and spelling as noted by classroom teachers are screened as well. Of course, I uh, mentioned that we utilize the Wilson multi-tiered system of support foundations, tier one and tier two for K-3. Uh, tier two, we utilize just words for grades four through 12. And then for tier three grades for students who are in grades uh, second through 12th grade, we use Wilson reading system. And you'll see that uh, currently our numbers, we have uh, 177 teachers in grades four through 12 who've been trained since two, uh, 2019 uh, with just words. Uh, where 2,400 students uh, in grades five through 12 uh, were screened uh, with that program in early 2020. And then uh, from that, we have identified uh, a little over a thousand students who could benefit from tier two instruction and they have been recommended for the Just Words course. And then in addition to that, uh, 262 students uh, would benefit uh, from tier three dyslexia intervention and were recommended for additional screening and placement. And you'll see for tier three, 164 of our teachers, K-12 have been trained since 2019. And so that they're able to serve the over 1,700 students who currently needs the dyslexia uh, intervention. And we have some numbers for you on here. Uh, you will see as compared to February, 2019, to September 2020, an elementary went, went, went from serving 898 students to 993, and secondary 79 students to 729, uh, for a total of 977 students in February 2019 to 1,722, which is great because we know when our students receive this type of dyslexia interventions, that impacts uh, all areas, all content areas, uh, more specifically reading, English uh, classes, their literacy skills. Uh, and so this is great news that we're able to identify more students and provide them the supports that they need. Superintendent so Ford. Can I jump in on this one again? And uh, Ms. Carpenter, let's give a, a, I know you're on here as well, and she's our, our dyslexic specialist. Can you go back to when you first were hired 
uh, in your role and just provide a little bit different context of uh, our growth because I think that gives even a better picture of uh, some of the good work that you've done. Yeah, sure. Um, I started in, I guess it was November or December 2018, and then we had an audit in January 2019. So it was good because I got to have a fresh slate for everywhere that we needed to go. And one of the biggest things that they found is that we were not identifying kids in secondary. And so as you can see from our numbers, um, we screened about 2,400 kids in January. <laughs> It was a lot of work and then the pandemic hit, but we have found a lot of kids that needed that help that weren't identified. And so um, now we have, I think we've gone up like 10 times the amount that we had in February. So um, I am really proud of our teachers and our um, staff just persevering through new programs and through the pandemic and making it work. So I think we're doing a really good job. I think we have, we have the most students out of any district in Arkansas, for sure. We so, are way higher. Yeah, let me jump in now, Ms. Carpenter. And, and one of the reasons we, we, we put this segment of the presentation together for you all is that as you run, a lot of times you'll run into individuals that are very passionate about supporting their child, especially if they have um, some sort of learning challenge. That could be dyslexia, it could be a student with an IP, it could be a student that's trying to learn a second language. And um, we wanted, this obviously doesn't cover all the nuts and bolts and the depth that you need, but we wanted to at least provide a baseline information of what we're doing. And with dyslexia in particular, tied to the science of reading, uh, the district has made uh, significant strides on really kind of going old school and going back to phonemic uh, awareness, uh, being able to teach uh, students how to sound out their words uh, and develop a, a skill set that will make them readers for life. Um, of course, students that may need extra support that have dyslexia, that's fallen into Ms. Carpenter's lap and she has really done a good job. So it's kind of a combination of the science of reading along with what we're doing with dyslexia. And really, again, I want to frame this in the fact that you're gonna, if we could have, <laughs> if you'd have ran two years ago, you would have had uh, a lot of folks talking to you about dyslexia in particular to say what's your thoughts, you gotta do something. Um, now we have folks that are helping us uh, solve the problem and um, the whole spirit and attitude about our support towards dyslexic learners has really changed. And I wanna give Ms. Carpenter credit, and also Hope Worsham, who's our executive director of curriculum instruction on tonight of the work that they've done. And I appreciate letting me butt in, Dr. Oa. I know I say I'm just gonna sit here and then I can't help myself. No, oh, it's fine, Superintendent for uh, continue to do it. I will also add, add that uh, our executive director, Hope Worsham, um, has really been working great with our curriculum instruction team to really look at our core instruction and to see how we can better support our students who may have needs in the dyslexia area but just uh, district-wide on how we can better uh, structure our instructional practices, provide capacity building for our uh, educators and different uh, content areas so that we can continue to meet the needs of our students. And so that team, our curriculum instruction team, is doing an excellent job uh, in just doing self-reflection and how we can continue to improve uh, our academics in the district, our academic support. Um, in addition to those support uh, areas, we also uh, provide the gifted and talented uh, support uh, programs. Uh, we provide these, uh, this program to approximately 3,737 identified students in grades uh, four through 12. Uh, during the K-2 years, our students receive whole group enrichment. And then uh, grades four and five, they participate in pull out and resource support for gifted and talented. Uh, in grades six through eight, they participate in gifted and talented seminar courses, as well as gifted and talented content courses in mathematics, English, social studies, and science uh, at uh, those two uh, middle schools, Pulaski Heights and Dunbar. Six through eight, uh, our students are also able to participate in pre-advanced placement courses 
as well as my students in grades nine through 12 have the opportunity to participate in uh, the pre-AP as well as AP courses and the effective needs support. These support services are provided by 29 elementary specialists and 27 middle high school facilitators and teachers. And so we'll continue to provide those supports throughout the district um, and then uh, provide guidance to our instructors as, as they provide the instruction to our gifted and talented students. And as you can see that we have uh, over 2,000, roughly 2,420 20 students currently enrolled in pre-AP, pre-advanced pre placement courses. We have 759 students in advanced placement courses, and then 14 students currently enrolled in concurrent credit. And we'll continue to work uh, to increase that number so that our students uh, would not only receive high school credit, but also college credit. And you can see that all of the pre-advanced uh, pre placement, advanced placement and concurrent credit courses are offered in grades six through 12 for all students. Uh, and we have AP coordinators at each high school to help facilitate that. And we continually to ensure that our staff are fully trained and provided the necessary resources to lead that instruction. Dr. Oa, just a point of clarification, and Ms. Shinoval can correct me if I'm wrong, but the 14, uh, concurrent, I, I know that might be like, wow, that seems significantly lower than I would have expected. Those are just for our GT students. Uh, that does not count the students that are a part of uh, concurrent type programs that can just happen in the traditional school setting or in our career tech programs. Am I correct on that, Ms. Shinova? Um, actually, that number is reflective of the data that I pulled yesterday from um, our report reporting system. However, I do feel that we're going to have a huge increase increase in those numbers because I know conversations are ongoing regarding that concurrent enrollment uh, process as uh, students are finalizing those agreements um, with the colleges in which their schools have have, uh, you know, partnered with to offer the concurrent coursework. So I know that's as of yesterday, but then I also know there are still conversations surrounding that enrollment process for them concurrently. So I expect that number to increase. Uh, last year, it was around 60 or more. Thank you. Dr. McKissick, would you like to share the supports that we're able to provide through federal programs? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would. Uh, currently, the Little Rock School District um, participates in multiple federal uh, programs. Um, our department uh, manages Title I, Title II, Title IV, McKinney Vento, 1003, and 21st Century. And when we look at the funding just in this year, we have over $15 million that we are disseminating through this office. So in that, we always think of our programming as what provides opportunity as well as support. So with Title I, the focus is the achievement of the disadvantaged. So that really points in the area of support. But then too, we provide the multiple opportunities for students to participate. So our free and reduced lunch rate or our poverty rate in the Little Rock School District is about 68%, very close to 70%. And we have, all, we, we need to provide much support as it relates to making sure that our children have every advantage they can to meet the achievement requirements that other children are expected to meet or that all children are expected to meet. So I just wanted to point out what's happening just to focus on just a few. We have any number of programs. You're welcome to touch base with me in any, at any point in time to talk about what may be happening in the federal programs department. But right now we're in the process of launching um, a virtual uh, homework helpline. And with that, we're hoping we're providing we will provide support to all of our families, anyone who has a need. And we are finding people from the community who have asked to provide support. Uh, we have teachers and administrators who are working, who want to be a part of this virtual opportunity. 
So we're hoping to roll that out in the very near future, maybe as early as Monday of next week. Uh, this was Dr. Owa's idea, and he just said, okay, can, uh, can, title, can title I do this? And the answer was yes, because it's a part of our charge is to be able to carry out the grant when we, do, when we have programming such as this. I think there may be another slide that talks about our homeless support. Uh, that's through McKinney Vento or the McKinney Vento grant. With that, we have the, the pleasure of serving our students who are in shelters, supporting those families that are in shelters. We, have, we work very closely with Student Support Services, Dr. Field's office, because between the two departments, we have to determine have they met the criteria? And once they do, what are the support structures that we have to have in place in order to make sure that those children have every chance that all barriers are reduced um, to make sure that they have access to what other students have. So we have any number of programs and um, we will share all of them with you. And I hope that there's another opportunity that we can talk more about federal programming because it is such a plus in a district our size. There are things that we simply could not do if we did not have those programs in place. Thank you, Dr. Owa. Thank you, Dr. McKissick. And before- Can I jump in real quick again, Dr. Owa? Yes, sir. One other thing, Dr. McKissick, that I know is a point of pride for you with parental support, not only of now developing this homework hotline, but uh, can you also just quickly share about the uh, parent academy approach that you've taken on and uh, I can't believe that didn't come up in this PowerPoint. So please, please share it real fast. Oh, thank you, Mr. Poor. I really appreciate that. Yes, uh, for the last, this will be our fourth year if we can manage it somehow virtually. But um, we have had parenting partners. Uh, we've joined together with Family Leadership out of California. They provide the curriculum. You know, we have great parent programs, but we did not have a curriculum in place for parents. And, and I know that there isn't a, a, a rule book for it, but we were hoping that we could find something that all parents could participate in, agree upon, and actually try. So we have had parents from every corner of the Little Rock School District, um, every economic bracket, we've had them to take part in this program. And, and every year we graduate a class. And our graduation classes have just taken on a life of their own because we have parents or grandparents who are graduating in cap and gown for the first time. And it is just, they are thrilled to become new ambassadors for the Little Rock School District. We have taken some of those parents who uh, graduated from the program and they have become our trainer of trainers for other parents, they actually go out and they work in schools with those parent groups to teach or share that curriculum from parenting partners. It is one of the jewels, I think, in our department. And thank you again for reminding me of that. Thank you, Dr. McKissick. You're welcome, I'm done. <laughs> Before we transition to our panel, I just wanted to check to see if uh, any of our uh, board candidates have any questions for our uh, district leaders before they depart us uh, this evening. I don't see any questions. So we're uh, transition to our uh, panel um, for the school governance panel. Uh, we have some experienced school board members with us. We have Dr. Julia Gardner, She's a family physician. Uh, she also works as the program director of family medicine res residency program. She's a member of the Highland School Board. Uh, and then she's also a member of the Arkansas School Board Association as a board member as well. Uh, she has, um, she was the daughter of, uh, of retired educators. Uh, and she also uh, served uh, in the K-12 Salem Public School System, or she attended the Salem Public School System. We also have Mr. Ron McDaniel. He was born and raised in Crossit. He now resides in Jacksonville, and he joined the United States Air Force in 1972 
but moved back to Jacksonville and finished his military career in 2012. He has uh, three children and all uh, of his adult children graduated from the Pulaski County Special School District schools. Um, and then he retired from the uh, military as a colonel after serving in the position of commander uh, for the Arkansas Air National Guard of Little Rock Air Force Base. He has served as a school board member uh, since the inception of Jacksonville North Pulaski School District. And then Tina Ward is our third uh, panelist. I'm not sure if she's joined us yet, but uh, we'll move forward. But Mrs. Ward serves uh, on the school board for Pulaski County Special School District. She's employed by the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Uh, at UAMS uh, since 2003. And she has children who actually attended Pulaski County Special School District. And so she wanted to give back by joining uh, that school board. So we're pleased and uh, honored to have the sitting uh, school board members with us. And we're going to uh, stop sharing our screen so that you can see them as they present. And then we'll get started with our questions. So with our uh, panelists, Dr. Garner, uh, Mr. McDaniel, Ms. Ward, uh, as you uh, answer this question, feel free to share any additional information um, with uh, this uh, group as well. But the first question is, what motivated you to become a board member? Who's going first? Since you talked to Mr. McDaniel, you can go ahead and then we'll go to uh, Dr. Gardner. Well, uh, the, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, well, the fact that uh, uh, I live in Jacksonville and Jacksonville's done so much for me as a, as a member of the community, I thought I'd give a little bit back. I'm, uh, uh, my main reason was the uh, academic, uh, uh, if you will, uh, perception of the uh, students in our district and I want to improve on that uh, our academic achievement uh, the other uh, thing that prompted me to become a member was the uh, fact that we're we're still under court court oversight federal court oversight and uh, I'd like to uh, work uh, with the other board members and and the district employees to get uh, unitary status for us in the near future so those are the primary reasons that that uh, I'm a, a board member and have been for uh, since the inception of the, uh, the district. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. Uh, Dr. Gardner, what motivated you to become a uh, school board member? And if you're talking, just a reminder that you're on mute, so uh, you have to unmute your phone, I mean, your device. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay, there we go. Um, I'm the child of educators, and when I had a child myself, my parents told me it was my responsibility as a parent with a child in the school to go to the board meetings, uh, volunteer at the school, and that attending the board meetings, I was to support the board, support the administration as a parent, and learn as much as I could about uh, what was going on at the school. I did that uh, for probably close to five or six years. I attended almost all of the school or at least half the school board meetings. And uh, when a position came open, I was asked uh, to join the board and was appointed from a position that was left vacant and then ran. So feeling the need to support the system. If I had a child in it, I felt like that was a responsibility. Thank you, Dr. Garner. So the next question is, what do you all, what do the two of you see the board's role and responsibilities? As a board member, what are your roles and responsibilities? And Dr. Garner, if you don't mind going first now, and then we'll uh, circle back to Mr. McDaniel. Well, the reading the, you can read all the guidelines, the hiring and the firing of the superintendent and doing those, but I felt like as a board member, uh, the most important thing that I did was every issue that came up needed to be asked, uh, will this benefit the kids? And that 
that was the question as a school board member I was there to ask every time an issue came up or every time a new program came up is this going to benefit the kids if the answer was no then it was move on to the next if the answer was yes then as a board member what was my role or my responsibility in helping the leaders of the district make that happen for the kids and I'll stop there thank you dr. Gardner mr. McDaniel what do you believe the board's roles and responsibilities are uh, as board members we are to uh, evaluate the performance of the superintendent of uh, our district we are to uh, not uh, be responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the uh, uh, district that is the superintendent's responsibility we evaluate him and uh, we provide him with support uh, in uh, completing his duties as requested <laughs> we don't micromanage the superintendent uh, he has the experience uh, and then we hired him uh, so we're, we we get out of his way and let him uh, do the things that he needs to do now we have to respond to uh, our uh, parents uh, in regard to issues that they find important so we have to go to the superintendent uh, most of the time individually and, and ex ask for uh, clarification on the issues that that uh, uh, concern a particular parent Thank and you. that's that's I'll close with that Thank you. Thank you. And as we move from there of what what both of you shared, who do you and in, in your perspective as sitting board members, who should set the rules governing board procedures, methods and behavior? Who should enforce them? So so who should set the rules governing board procedures, methods and behavior? And then who should enforce them? Mr. McDaniel? Uh, well, we we the board members, uh, uh, set the procedures for our board uh, based upon what's uh, uh, the Arkansas Superintendent, excuse me, School Board Association provides us with uh, guidance. But uh, we make sure that, uh, uh, as as uh, stated previously, that when we do some some type of policy, we take in consideration the uh, the uh, the student, the the, the, the young people. And make sure that it, we're not doing anything that will harm their uh, ability to be educated. So that's uh, my thoughts on that. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Gardner. Would you like to add anything to that? Um, I, he's the same way we function. Of the board says the procedure. The Arkansas uh, School Board Association has. Uh, an entire list of things that we are responsible for and how we proceed and the, the procedures that we do. Um, anytime anyone acts on any board, I think uh, behavior is a uh, thing that you should monitor yourself for. Professional behavior is expected. You expect it of your school leaders and you expect it of the, of the kids. So it starts with the board. So monitoring the board itself and uh, being open to receiving feedback on what's going on, I think is gonna be really important for that. And then being accountable. The School Board Association has accountability for some of the actions. Thank you both. And, and moving towards more so of the governing, how can a board, how can a board member know if it's goal or- Dr. Oh, yes, sir. I wanna, in particular, uh, Mr. McDaniel, who I don't believe I've met before, so I apologize for putting you on the spot, but your, your, your situation of having a brand new board come into Jacksonville where there was none, in some ways resembles the Little Rock situation because we've been absent of an elected board for more than five years. So as you all undertook that, Mr. McDaniel, was there something that you felt was really important when you start to talk about board governance and board um, kind of behavior and rules and getting along that you all established as you first came together? Uh, Superintendent uh, Poor, we uh, we had our, our what, do, what do you call them, uh, <clears throat> uh, pains of uh, learning. Uh, the, the thing that uh, uh, helped us out is that we developed a respect for each other and our, each other's opinions as board members. 
we all know that uh, uh, the, even though there's a president uh, of a board, they don't have the uh, sole responsibility for making decisions. It's, a, it's a, uh, the members of the board vote on issues. So we had to learn how to uh, uh, be uh, professional with each, other, with each other and make sure that uh, we got the full information on, on the issues that are presented to us so that we could uh, come to a, to a uh, an agreement on, on the way to go forward. Does that answer pretty much? Uh, I could, you know, I, I could go into detail. We had a lot of uh, challenges uh, as far as uh, uh, getting taxes uh, passed to uh, uh, property tax passed to uh, build our new, new schools that we're building. So we had a lot of challenges that uh, we had to uh, uh, present ourselves with and, uh, and some uh, areas of the community were not uh, as cooperative as we would have wanted them to. So we had to overcome those barriers, but uh, I hate to be redundant, but it, it's for the kids. If uh, whatever we do is for the benefit of the kids and, and, and our community, then uh, we always uh, 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 fell on the side of that's what we're going to do, the positive uh, things for the kids. That cover it, uh, Dr. Ford, or do you need to elaborate more? No, thank you. And I think that some of the next questions will uh, let you go into a little more detail. So thank you. The next question is, how can a board know if its goals are being accomplished and its policies carried out? How do you know when the goals are being accomplished and the policies that the board makes are being carried out? Dr. Gardner. A big part of it is keeping up with reports. Uh, the leaders uh, are providing a lot of reports and, the, and, and you should expect that they would, but if you're sent those, it's reading it, keeping up with it, paying attention and understanding when the goals should be met and uh, when that's available, because some of the things that you start, you won't see for several years, uh, but some of the things you start, you'll see immediate, but it's being involved, paying attention and showing up at the right places. Mr. McDaniel? That's, uh, actually, that's uh, uh, correct. We just have to be in, involved, not so much in, again, the day-to-day -day operation, but we have to keep our ears open in the community uh, we, we need to get feedback uh, uh, from uh, the uh, parents and the students about what we're doing uh, right and what we're doing wrong. And uh, you have to make uh, adjustments uh, based upon uh, uh, what you uh, uh, was brought to you as far as comments. And uh, uh, we try to do that in a way that is respectful and, and professional and ensure that the uh, parents and the students uh, feel like they're uh, they're appreciated for what the, what they uh, what they're telling us about the different issues that that are presented to them. Thank you. Next question with one or two meetings a month all school board members or school boards are limited in what they can do. How does this or how should the board decide what's most important to address or discuss? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, well, you, you, you prioritize, uh, actually your president uh, is the one that uh, uh, kind of leads the way in relation to uh, prioritizing what's imp important uh, in respect to what you need to, to deal with. Uh, we, we have been doing a lot of dealing with, uh, what's this thing called? Coronavirus or something like that. But uh, that uh, and making sure that the, the, uh, the, the young people in that respect uh, and which everybody's dealing with it, but uh, they're as safe as possible. Uh, we have to, uh, we've got a lot of going on, going on now with uh, uh, construction. So we have to be sure that, uh, that that's going on. And we have to look at the areas, uh, as I said earlier, that we are trying to get the unitary status in those areas that have to uh, uh, be monitored uh, we have to make sure that we're going in the right direction on those and, and ask questions about uh, uh, achievement, uh, 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 potential uh, for improvement, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, 
the fact that uh, discipline is a uh, is a uh, an issue in in regards to uh, the uh, uh, court case, the ongoing court case that we're on. So we have to look at make sure those areas are prioritized as far as uh, not letting them uh, kind of uh, go to the wayside, even though we're in this uh, particular situation we're in now. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. And Dr. Gardner, I have a different question for you. Uh, how would you handle, or how have you handled requests uh, from individuals, um, special interest groups? How do you handle those requests as a board member that you may receive uh, within the community? Listen, uh, make very little comment, uh, no decisions, and uh, keep my opinions to myself uh, while listening to them. Everybody needs to be heard. Everybody's issues need to be heard. And uh, that's passed then directly, usually to the superintendent. And um, I usually encourage, I'm in a smaller district, but I usually encourage uh, parents or people that have special interest, if they um, have information, I encourage them to send it directly to the superintendent so that he's aware of what's going on or the needs. But it's not my job as the school board member to make any decisions or side in. It is my job to listen and uh, then evaluate as a board to make decisions as the board, as the superintendent has gathered information. And our meetings are set with the president and the superintendent and the superintendent then provides all the background and needed information for any, any issue that comes up. And that's, that's the most important piece is you've got to hear all sides of every issue. And there may be two, but there may be 10 sides to every issue and the board's got to hear them all. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. And we have just a couple more questions. And so I uh, don't want to hold you much longer, but uh, Mr. McDaniel, what qualities or behaviors should board members exhibit? From your perspective, from your experience, what qualities and behaviors should board members exhibit? Well, obviously, uh, mutual respect for each other and uh, each other's opinions about uh, different issues. Uh, uh, they have to uh, understand that everybody's not going to agree completely uh, on an issue, but uh, uh, to uh, uh, ask questions and, and get uh, feedback. And at the end of the day, if, if everybody's not agreeing on it, if there's a vote that's uh, uh, held and it passes or it fails, uh, they understand that uh, people have different opinions on how things will be done. and, and uh, don't take it personally. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. And uh, Dr. Gardner, what, from your perspective and experience, what do you believe the role of the superintendent is? And if you don't mind, describes, describe the superintendent's role. Not one I would think I could manage. Uh, the superintendent's uh, role is to assess all issues involving the school. Dr. Poor is, it, noted that as you went through everything he is up on everything that you presented and able to comment on it it's his role to support uh, the leaders it's also to support the uh, faculty and the staff and uh, oversee provide background to the board and give the board the information they need to make decisions but his number one priority is the first kid that steps off of the bus that day. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Gardner. And for both of you, the last question, how can you contribute? How can a school board member contribute to a successful board meeting? And we'll start with Mr. McDaniel. Uh, you can uh, uh, not uh, overly, uh, uh, could you say dramatize an issue? <laughs> I mean, uh, you need to, to uh, address an issue, but uh, don't spend uh, uh, 15 minutes talking about uh, an issue that uh, uh, you, you feel is important, but that everybody else might not feel is as important. So just keep it short uh, uh, and, and 
uh, the, the thing about uh, uh, a superintendent is you can have one-on-ones with superintendents, board members can, and you can't go more than two at a time, but you can have one-on-ones and you can try to uh, uh, get the information that you need before the meeting and, uh, and have a good idea so that you can keep the meeting short if there's an issue that's uh, kind of controversial. Thank you. And Dr. Gardner, how can you contribute to a successful board meeting? Uh, a big portion is do your background homework, uh, make sure you understand the issues. And I agree that meeting with a superintendent one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you should never blindside your superintendent in uh, a board meeting or blindside your other board members. Uh, and if the homework is done and you understand the issues, then you can have discussion or uh, provide information but there really shouldn't be any uh, dissension in a board meeting among the members because nobody knew what was going to happen or, do, or to uh, go with, through with the meeting. But the mutual respect and listening to the board members because as many board members as you have, you will have that many opinions on different issues. Uh, and it's just important to listen. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. Uh, Mr. McDaniel, very sound uh, guidance and experience uh, uh, perspectives from your experience. Uh, before we conclude, any last uh, remarks or any last commentary that you would like to share just from your experience uh, from being a school board member? Mr. McDaniel, well, we'll do ladies first. Dr. Gardner. Follow up, and, oh. and it may be that some of our, our candidates might want to ask questions, and I, I want to set the stage with. Uh, just a, a question to both of you. What what surprised you when you were elected that you just didn't expect when you came into the role of a board member? Uh, something that you weren't prepared for or something that was maybe a big challenge to overcome uh, either as an individual or as a, a with a team uh, that's is the makeup of the board? I, I think I, I can answer that. I, I think that uh, when I got on the board, I thought, uh, and I had attended a lot of board meetings and listened, but my anticipation was you could just make decisions and it be done. And that's not always the case. There are rules to follow. There are guidelines. You can decide that an employee uh, shouldn't be at the school. And there are lots of rules and guidelines that have to be followed uh, before that can be changed. And uh, I, I think there's just more to it than you think of when you're sitting on the outside, well, just why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? And I, I think that's a big, a big thing that was an eye opener for me is that having run an, uh, my own private business and making my own decisions that you can't just do that immediately. Yeah, I'll have to agree with uh, Dr. Garner on that. Uh, am I on? Yes, sir. We hear okay. you. Okay, I, I can uh, uh, attest to that. Also, you just uh, you you uh, uh, when I was in the military and I was a commander, I uh, I pretty much made decisions. I had a little bit of input, but uh, <laughs> that's not the way the board works. So it, you have to uh, uh, get a consensus on uh, on things. Uh, the other thing is uh, I the number of meetings that we've had over the years and Dr. Orr will attest to that when he was we, he was with us uh, especially gotten more and more meetings now with the construction going on it's just uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, things going on that uh, uh, I didn't anticipate but uh, it's all for the uh, the good of the uh, of the students and again that's uh, that's what we're all about thank you are there any other questions for our two Panelists. Uh, someone did, uh, and I don't know how to uh, do this, but someone did ask if I was from Crossett, Arkansas. I am from Crossett, Arkansas. Graduated in 1970. So I just celebrated my 50th anniversary. Oh yeah, 50th year of uh, since graduation. So to, to whoever sent me that, I can't electronically answer you. Dr. O, I have a question quickly. I just wanted to ask the board members, how do you balance representing the people in your zone and 
also you know, doing what's in the best interest of the entire district. If you ever have um, any concerns about that, just wondered what your thoughts were. If I could go, go, I am an at large uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 board member, so I represent everyone. So I, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, not in that situation where I have to go in a zone. And, and we deliberately uh, set it up to where uh, we have two at large and we have seven board members, two at large and five zones within our, uh, in our district. And, it, and, and that's another thing. It really helps out when you're dealing with issues uh, and some people get zoned if you know what I mean, <laughs> they, they, they think about just their little area rather than the, than the big picture. So that's, uh, that's we, we thought it was important to do an at large, uh, uh, two at larges and then five zone uh, board member. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hall, we have a similar setup. Uh, I'm in a zone and fortunately, we've not had issues that uh, one zone or the other uh, had issues that didn't affect uh, everybody. So that's, that's never been an issue that we have dealt with that um, one zone had needs that would uh, uh, affect the others in a negative fashion. If I could, I'd like to add in to the, the comments that uh, from the question Ms. Nolan presented that um, one of the things that I think all of you as board members even understand it better now than ever because you're running right now and you've got the races and you have, you know, an area that you know you're, you're trying to pull votes from um, and you have schools inside of those. And so, you know, you kind of have that, that attachment part. But, you know, the reality is if we're going to function well as a school board, we have to kind of think beyond that into this bigger group to say, here is Little Rock School District, and here are our biggest priorities that we want for our children. And then where things can get, uh, I think, where you can start to dive into certain aspects of certain parts of the city is there may need to be greater resources provided to a certain part. Um, but I'm telling you, that's not easy uh, because you're, no, you're going to have to run again at some point, but effective boards do look at the biggest picture of the district. And you sometimes even see this in city and national government where everybody gets so hunkered down into one little thing. But when I think good decision making gets elevated when we think about it in a larger context. And, and it's not easy, uh, as probably both Mr. McDaniel and Ms. Garner can say, because even uh, you know, in this Congress community, which is a little bit smaller, I guarantee if she goes into a grocery store, there's somebody going to be in her ear about a very specific uh, recommendation on a hot topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions for our panelists? All right. Well, definitely, uh, again, oh, did I hear someone? Definitely, again, uh, thank you, Dr. Gardner, uh, Mr. McDaniel, for joining us tonight. I know that you all are busy, and uh, we appreciate your uh, guidance and your uh, for your willingness to provide us your perspective as uh, school board members. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Superintendent Ford, uh, do you have some closing remarks? I am going to bring up this last screen about our next four candidate training information session, but do you have closing remarks? I do, and I, I also want to thank uh, Mr. McDaniel and Dr. Garner for joining us this evening. And I also want to thank each of you for your investment of time tonight, but also your willingness to run and stick your neck out because uh, that, that in itself in this day and age is, is uh, you know, worthy of, of praise. So thank you. Uh, for your willingness to, to jump forward. The, um, we are gonna do one more uh, kind of work session and, and we have two big topics. One is budget oriented and the other one is Ford NGL. Uh, Ford NGL is really a critical component of our future direction uh, of career academy approach and trying to prepare kids 
we're uh, being, what they do when they leave us as 12th graders, um, whether it's going into post-secondary or into a workforce environment, doing education at a later stage. Um, this is a big topic and, and we wanna have you all prepared to just understand where we're headed on there. But then the budgets, it's gonna be interesting because we actually approve the budget you all will operate under this coming month here in September. So in, in reality, when we talk about this in October, we're gonna be sharing with you, here is the approved budget for this academic year, 2020-21, and you'll get to understand the revenues and the expenditures, and then you're gonna be given by our chief financial officer a mechanism where you'll start to understand the way to track the budget items either as the CAD finishes its work or you begin your work uh, in December. So we think that'll be of value. We also want to try to make sure you're aware of the federal and state type budgets that come in. Uh, that especially many of those support those special populations that we talked about today. So um, that will be our last uh, significant uh, training prior to your election. And uh, we will have uh, the Chamber of Commerce, James Reddish, Christy Barr, probably Ford NGL, Kelsey Bailey helping on the operating budgets, and then federal and state budget will be Dr. McKissick and, and uh, Dr. Owa helping us out on those. And, and we hope these have been valuable, and we hope it's not a waste of your time. We also, I, I again, appreciate the willingness that all of you have had to uh, do the one-on-one -on -one with me. As you heard from Mr. McDaniel and Dr. Garner, that is a key aspect that happens with members of their superintendents, uh, being able to, to talk uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to that opportunity to work with each of you as individuals here in the very near future, but um, thank you is the, is the final comment for this evening, and, and uh, thank you for your investment of time. And I'll, Dr. Owen, do you want the last comment? Oh, no, sir. Uh, you, uh, you're the superintendent, so I, I appreciate you closing us out. Uh, I'll just say good night to everyone, and thank you for joining us. Thank you again. Have a good rest of the evening. Good, yeah, good night. Of thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night.